G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. In 2009, had the idea to create an iPad app. During 2011, in his mid-30s, got serious, shut down his five-person digital agency in Hobart and pivoted all in to create the multi-award winning and number one paid creative app in the iTunes store called Procreate. With 40 staff that now land more than 30 million a year in revenue, the only investors in the business are James and his wife, who looks after the strategy and finances. Knocking back many VCs, funding has been all from cash flow, though it was very tight during the early transitional years when moving from an agency model to one app, down to their last 20 grand in the bank and only weeks, if not days, of runway. They invest heavily in culture and only letting A players on their bus and know all too well the pain of B, C or assholes getting through. James believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is the mindset of money versus services or product. Focus everything you've got to make the most exquisite product you can. The advice he'd give himself on day one is, don't worry, it's going to get better. Keep going. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing James Cooter from Savage Interactive here in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. Thanks for your time today, James. Happy. Pleasure to be here. Maybe let's start with how we know each other. It's through Tim Palmier, isn't it, from Flat Tummy Tea? Yeah, yeah. I met Tim a few years ago at a, at a bit of a dinner. Had a nice mutual kind of uh, interest in tech, so yeah. The Hobart seems to be a bit of a tech hub at the moment. You've got James at Biteable, who's been on the cast, as well as Tim and yourself. Last week, I mean, Ben Crowley from Bulk Nutrients, who's also a big online business here in Tasmania. So there's a lot of little hidden uh, tech companies. I mean, Tassie's always kind of punched above its weight in many different industries, but it's nice to see, even in the, you know, we've been in business now like nine years, from when we started nine years ago to where we are now, there's definitely more people on the scene, which is bloody fantastic for the state. Yeah, it is. It is great. That leads us into, tell us a little bit about your business. Savage is the developer behind Procreate, and Procreate is the number one best-selling paid app on iPad. It's won App of the Year multiple times, won Apple Design Awards. It's it actually won a, a lot of awards. It's predominantly used for people who like to draw and paint and illustrate. It's used now at the highest level of the creative industry. So, you know, Disney are using it, Pixar. I was, I was actually watching this. I was browsing on the McLaren site, just kind of browsing away as you do, looking at the 720S, lovely car. And uh, as I was browsing, they had a little video on the 720S and they had the lead designer there. First thing I saw was uh, him sketching on Procreate, which was really cool. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's been a a labor of love for many, many years. And uh, it's now in version five, leading the pack in in its field. And it keeps us really, really busy. And uh, just out of interest, are you on other platforms like Android or it's just iPhone, iTunes? It's just for the iPad. You know, we've done a few business cases looking at other platforms. The thing is we want to make the best experience in the world. And so like moving to Android, it's possible, but we can't deliver that same premium experience we can on one platform. We even looked at doing uh, desktop versions, but um, for drawing, there's nothing better right now than the Apple Pencil and iPad. We're kind of sticking with that platform. Yeah, right. Okay. And tell us how you started out. Where did the idea come from and those, that first year or so? It's going back a while. Yeah. I used to have a little creative agency in Murray Street and uh, it was only like a you know, five-man operation. It's a good learning curve back then. But one thing that really pissed me off about doing business down here locally was it was really frustrating to try and be expressive, be creative, really stretch your legs, try and do something interesting. When you're kind of limited by the market, you can't really find out how far that, you know, that creative streak goes. So I think it was at about 2009, I was just kind of jacked, to be honest, just mm. getting up every day, just doing work, just shitty work for... Groundhog you know. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I started thinking about, you know, at the time, it was all about websites and, you know, that everyone was doing, you know, big, crazy websites, portals. You remember probably content management systems was like the hottest shit people were doing back then. Yeah, we tried to build one of our own. Yeah, yeah. We had a we launched a web com- web design and development company in Melbourne in late '99, and of course tried to build our own um, content management system about the time I think that uh, WordPress was starting up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that was the hotbed, right? And we were no different. We built uh, a CMS. It was all front end editing, which was really different at the time. We built a lot of internal tools, but where the idea really came from to to create a dedicated uh, software shop was was interesting. 
we built this software called Onyx, mm -hmm. and Onyx was built to run the shop. So it was essentially you would quote jobs. The jobs would then go into in progress. They would move from in progress to getting assigned, and then they'd get billed. I was having this um, uh, quote kind of meeting with it with a customer, and I, and I was just listening to what he wanted, and I was filling in the you know filling in through all the fields on our online kind of form. And at the end of the conversation, I just pinged him a PDF of the quote. And he's like, holy shit, mm. how'd you do that? I was wow. like, oh, it's just my, you know, our software. And he wanted to take a look at it and he was really fascinated by it. And he said something that literally just changed my, my whole kind of world. Can I license that? <laughs> I'd never even like thought about licensing. Because for me, it was like, I'm, we make this stuff for us, you know? Yeah. So to hear someone wanted to use it, my first instinct was, no, you can't, <laughs> you can't have it. Yeah. But I couldn't get it out of my head, you know, like, selling software and uh that was a really interesting idea so we we kind of started, started to kind of grow out of that and what i determined from that kind of internalization of what it would look like with a software shop was i didn't want to do the like for client thing i've been doing that right i didn't, didn't want to do that anymore so i wanted to do something direct to consumers and then uh, when the ipad came out it was kind of like a light bulb it was just like that's going to be the future. Yeah. That's what kids are going to use. And at the time, it was like people were people were shit canning and saying, oh, "It's just a toy. Yes. It's going to fail. It's you know, it doesn't got a good. You can only consume content on it, which was great mm. because we jumped on it when yeah. no one took it seriously, and we we started building tech, hardcore hardcore graphics tech for this uh, new platform at in da on day one. So that's that's kind of the the, the journey. And you know, we we shut up the old shop and. Mm -hmm transferred through it was a pretty tumultuous time a bit but uh yeah so idea in 2009 really launched 2011 really got correct to yeah so to give the audience a bit of context especially those that aren't familiar with apple or you know tech per se that was 2009 was still pretty uh wild west days of apps and etc because was it 2006 totally. that that Apple brought out the well, iPhone. The, yeah, and the thing is, the App Store. Steve was really against was. the App Store. He yeah. hated the yeah. idea. Um, and when when we launched in 2011, the App Store was baby. There was only a few apps in the store. Wow. Yeah. Um, yet no one was, was really we no one really understood how to make money from it. Everyone was just charging like a dollar, <laughs> yeah. a dollar for an app. And yeah. and it was difficult for us because we were making you know high uh, high performance creative software. Um, for a bloody for a coffee, so it was like five bucks. Yeah. So it was it was hard going in the early days. And so, what's the pricing now for the app? It's doubled. It's ten bucks now. Yeah. Um, but you know, you have to comp you, you're virtually competing with free. Yes. Um, or subscription. Mm. And uh, you know, I'm not a fan of subscription personally for tools. I mean, it's a legitimate business model like Netflix. Holy shit, I love that business model. Yeah, it's great. Isn't I it? give you money, you give me content, yeah. and we just keep that deal going on forever. Yeah. But when it's a tool. Even if you, you know, imagine going to Bunnings and getting a, yeah. you know, an impact drill. Yeah. You've got to subscribe to that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do that. I don't yeah. want my tools to be a subscription. So we've kept Procreate uh, a one-time cost. Yeah. And we're trying to just get as many people on board as possible. And what about other products? Did you launch anything to cross-sell or is it just the one? We have a very ambitious plan, which I can't go into. Yeah. But I can say Procreate is the start of something Quite ambitious. Right. We've been working on some things for some time now. Yep. Yeah. And how old were you back in 2011 when you decided to get serious about this? Mid 30s. Mid 30s. Just, yeah. Right. So that's yeah. a pretty big jump out of an agency into the unknown, really. Oh, mate, I shit my pants to be honest with you, because yeah. you know I had to let some people go. We had to release the office, but and like shutting your business down that's healthy yes people just think you're bananas so, so there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of personal conflict that went on I, I got i got all sorts of just like people said to me what are you doing you're doing apps yeah. that doesn't sound like you're gonna make much money mate <laughs> and uh and uh and other people were saying like this is going to be the worst mistake you make in your career mate mm -hmm. i don't understand why you're shutting your, you're shutting it all down so at the time, you know, I'm kind of beating sweat every night, <laughs> not knowing if it's going to work yeah. out. But I had to do it because I was done um, just getting up every day for no reason. Yes, it had to. I had you have to have meaning in what you do in life. You know? Yeah. And what about business partners? Did you launch Savage with business partners or did you have business partners in the agency? So my wife was my business partner in Savage and we have tried bringing people in, but we decided with the software company we'd make a, key, a, a 
clean break mm. and we would just manage the term. We've got a really good ability to um, delineate between our roles. I'm, you know, product focus CEO. She takes more of a kind of a step back strategy and um, uh, sort of financial. Yeah. So it works really, really That's well. Good. Yeah. yeah. And we've, we've made a decision not to bring VCs in. We've had VCs bash from our door for years. I bet. It's just not our strategy. Yeah. That's good. So James, can you tell us any key numbers you're able to share with us to illustrate the growth? Yeah, the numbers were pretty slow in the beginning because we were, you know, selling a five dollar app. It was an unknown product, but um, from that point to where we are now, we're turning over just over thirty mil a year. Wow. We've got uh, just coming onto forty employees. Yep. we've got millions of customers in pretty much every geo. Our main geos are United States, China. Um, and Europe essentially as a, right. as a conglomerate. So yeah, um, and yeah, the, the, there's there's it's it's an interesting thing of the growth period was very much, you know, in the from pretty much 2011 to about 2015, it was pretty hard going. Like we were just making ends meet. Yeah, um, and then finally, kind of all took off and around that kind of 2016 mark, we've had just. We've had growth, uh, you know, year over year has just been astronomical growth from there. Yeah, right. So if the top one's thirty million, then that means Apple's reaping about nine million. Yeah, but it's, it's still a good deal though, right? Because yeah. like back in the old days, if we had to press CDs, print yes. the manuals, get the boxes, mm. you know, ship containers every which way, it'd be way more than thirty percent. Yeah. Um. So it's a pretty good deal. No, I think know? it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I launched a few apps when I was living in London a few yeah. years ago. And- getting to know the model, et cetera. For those mm. in the audience that don't understand it, Apple, most app stores charge 30% to have your, your app listed in their store. Apple certainly does. They have from day one. And I remember reading a few years ago that they were, they were, Apple was earning something like $2 billion a year. I know it'll be much higher than that now, yeah. just from the app store. It was a genius move, and particularly when Steve Jobs didn't really back the idea, but was humble enough to... Listen to his people. That's yeah. right. Because his people were, were like, you know, this is a great business case, can really inject a lot of, you yep. know, blood into the platform. And it did. It, arguably, you know, every platform in tech, you need to have a good developer base. Like, you know, if you look at Windows back in the day, the reason why it was crushing everyone is essentially because it had a great integration of software like Office, et cetera, but it also had the support of the entire development community. Yeah. And in 2020, now it's Apple, but they have the entire support of the yeah. development community. It's a key, mm-hmm. I think, in, in really gaining that top tier yeah. in the tech world. Well, let's talk about funding the business. Mm-hmm. And obviously not now. You sound very cash flow positive, but mm-hmm. back in the, in the start, did you take on any funding, bank debt, or there were no investors, you said? No. So what we did when we closed down the agency, we had about 20K of cash. Yep. I can tell you now, it's not a lot of money to start a software company. We kind of burnt through it pretty quick. But... The idea was we ran the numbers and if we could sustain, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but if we could sustain X amount of sales per day, we yep. could just make ends meet. And we did that for a while. We thought about getting venture capital in pretty much about a year into it because we were starting to get, it was mm. really, really hairy uh, cost-wise. Uh, we've taken no loans. Uh, we, we've tried to always run businesses that are uh, always in the black. It's just mm. our preference to run it that way. Um, and the reason why we didn't want investors is because we have a pretty clear vision of what we're trying to accomplish. We really want to change the creative industry and it comes from humble beginnings, but you need to have that kind of um, laser focus. Yes. And if we bring people in, our worry was, could just all go to shit. They're just yeah. going to you know, raise headcount. Let's go and get other people involved. This, the whole trajectory could change. We're just not willing to risk our life's work uh, for that. We'd much rather do it slower. Yes. But uh, get to the finish line, the, and, the way and we have want more to. control over that destiny. To- totally. And over the low, I guess over the last nine years, a lot of tech companies, not just here in Hobart, obviously, but Silicon Valley around, they go hell for leather. They're all about growth, growth at all costs. Growth and tip all the money out of the bank and get more in and just growth, growth, growth. But you guys have chosen a bit more of a conservative path, um, still with phenomenal growth, but in the tech. Uh, arena, I guess. It's, it's still small. Like, like we haven't IPO'd and gone to a billion, for instance. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, and a lot of companies, like I'm sure if we were to go down that path, we could easily start you know, heading down that direction. For us, it's all about what drives you know, the company. What's the, the reason for the company to exist? For us, it's not about growth at all costs. Yeah. It's about really trying to change an industry and doing it by making the best products in the world. That's really where it, where it comes down to. And yes, you can, you, there's many different arguments, but 
um, that's that's the kind of the it's it's what we favour. Yeah, right. Okay, know. great. And in funding, mm. any government grants, journey? No, mate. The government, you know, oh, that's a whole different podcast. I think we could have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. put a few people on that one. Oh, yeah. mate. Like, no. That, I did, look, our government don't understand tech. They need to get on board. They yep. have no idea, you know, what's happening. We have grown here despite mm. the government. There yep. is no help we've received, which is appalling, but. It is the situation that we have right now. You know, we use the exporting marketing grant, which is great, yep, but yep. these are quite small in comparison to... But yeah, look, I could probably sit here for another hour and we won't keep it focused on tech. <laughs> yeah, I think it was Rod Askew a few episodes ago who owns Black Cow and mm. Stillwater up in Launceston. Mm. When I asked him what was uh, the most stressful, I think, memory in his in business in his 36 years running those restaurants, he said it was government red tape and... Just governments don't get it. So you're not wrong. No. So on to that question. Mm. So what has been the most stressful point in your business journey so far? It's a hard question yeah. because there's so many of them. Yes. I think one of the early ones was when we were developing tech back in the early days, we misaligned our timing of how long stuff would take. And we went down to about five weeks of operation. That's right. all we could afford. Yeah. Which was actually the moment we were thinking, oh shit, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have to bring in some investors. And I can tell you now that, you know, really that was flying by the, yeah, yeah that, it was it was harrowing actually yeah. is a, probably a better way to term it because, you know, we'd shut everything down. We'd taken a big risk. We'd, we'd spent, you know, a lot of time telling people around town, we're moving on, we're doing this thing. Put, pretty much put everything I had on the line yeah. and it was all about to go tumbling down. Yeah, right. That would be a very stressful point. It was. What areas in business do you feel you had to work on the most to add the greatest value? I think the thing for us is that the best value that we get as a business, we generate IP from our people. Mm -hmm. And so our people are, are probably the biggest thing to always, you know, invest back in. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's a lot to manage with that. It's a lot of, you know, time and energy that goes into that. But it is worth it because at the end of the day, in tech, tech is derived from people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's good. And what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? Not planning for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, in all seriousness, like each time I'm conservative, like, oh, with this release, with that happening, with this kind of, you know, uh, eventualities happening on the platform, it should be X. And then it's, you know, Y. Yeah. So, you know, I, I always think it's good for everyone. We should always be conservative in our outlooks. But uh, at the same time, I think the biggest thing, I, you know, that, that I found is, to anticipate that growth and to and to plan for it because each time it just bites us in the ass as yeah. we're growing mm. it just you know really hits us hard so that that's something I, I'm still learning I'm still learning how to uh, handle that you know each year that horizon gets gets much much bigger yeah right and what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey I think that's I think it's actually it plan like the fact of you know it's hard when you're a small operator back you know when i had my agency you're talking about maybe you turn over a million you know yeah. maybe mm. and so that mindset of you know running a shop on a you know on a shoestring you know planning for how we're going to do business locally changing that because we, we've been a global business since 2011 but you know we're based here in hobart so to try and change that mindset for you know having lots of liquid capital able to grow faster able to move it's a really hard thing to to kind of adapt to we're doing okay but like i said that's probably the biggest you know my personal kind of confrontation at the moment is trying to deal with that growth planning and what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain absolute tenacity even when shit's going bad <laughs> you gotta hang on yeah you just gotta hang on uh, half the reason to success is just turning up every day. Yes. And it's so true. Yeah. Woody Allen. I can't remember. It was some... It was it was some Woody, yeah, it was Woody Allen. Woody Allen, yeah. 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 Uh, I didn't think it was Woody Harrelson. But uh, that is so true. Just like just turning up and grinding, yep. even when shit's going down. Yes. Um, it is such an important factor being in business. You've got to have that tenacity. I don't know how many times... and it just I've been in business, you know, coming on 10 years now for the software. Thing. Yes. In that time, I've seen so many of my competitors burst on the scene and, yeah, fizzle out. I mean, it's fucking hard, right? Like, it takes so much out of you. As a founder, there is so much energy and no one understands it. No one gets it unless you're probably another founder. But yeah. around you, you know, you're, you've got a kind of a lot on your, on your plate. So having that tenacity just to push through. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of the three things when I asked the question of Sam Reed, from, well, the co-founder of Willie Smith's, mm. what would you tell yourself on day one? I think he said... 
You actually gave three answers to that. One of them was that you won't realize how lonely it's going to be being a leader or being the leader effectively in the business. So Yeah, it's something you're not prepared for. And it kind of creeps up on you too because when you start, like, it, well, it depends on, on your model, but you know, in my position, when, when you start small, you intimately know everyone. Yes. But as you grow, it very quickly be, you become isolated. Yeah. And, uh, and because it is such a kind of a long thing, you kind of, the old analogy of cooking the frog, but, you know, if, you, if you've got the right tenacity and willpower, you, you can push through that and surround yourself with people of, you know, like minds. And, yeah. and that leads us into the next question. How have you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? I think for, for everyone listening, I think the biggest thing in business is people. It doesn't really matter what industry. It's, it's people that really are the biggest asset. And, you know, when you get a great hire, we, we try and hold on to them yeah. uh, as best we can, lavish them, treat them, you know, we should treat everyone well, but really go out of your way to make sure they have everything they need to do their job. Isn't there just a massive chasm between an A player and a B player? Oh, my God. Don't you notice it? No, it's not, it's not even, it's, it's like different worlds. Yeah. They're just, yeah, yeah they're, they're just totally different. And can, inversely, having a bad person, hmm. I mean, we had like last shit year. Attitude. Oh, mate. Yeah. It, we, we, had, we had someone last year that was, it was so bad that you, you don't really realize how that toxic kind of behavior spreads. Yeah. But we have a pretty, pretty, you know, strict rule of, you know, hiring and firing. Yeah. And uh, even, even though we took action and that person's gone, it's still a lesson to learn. Each, each one, each, each time you, you know, we fire someone, it's a, it's a real lesson learned. But um, yeah. the key is to hire better. Absolutely. Learn from it. Mm. There was a book I read a few years ago when I got back from London called The No Asshole Rule. Mm. And it's very much on that message of it doesn't matter if you're in your sales team, this guy is, is knocking his targets out of the park, beating everyone by tenfold. If he's an asshole and he's toxic to the culture and, and the rest of the business, people are going to start leaving. You know, to- totally. Team and, and, and you know, the, 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 the word culture, like for me, culture is just a running behavior of the team for a set, you know, determinable period of time. So when you're looking at the culture, it's just how we're treating each other. Yes. And when you get an asshole in there, yep. it totally disrupts that. Yes. And you've got to keep the, the team clean with just kind, friendly, driven people. And magic happens when you've got that kind of environment. Yeah. We'll talk about culture in a minute, but I do want to, hone in a bit here on so how have you gotten better or now that you are much better at getting those a players on the bus as jim collins talks Mm, about mm. built to last you know because a lot of that stuff can be hard to determine in interviews oh mate their attitude for example yeah it's really hard it's interesting because when we were smaller we kind of attracted people who were naturally um, not only with a players they wanted to take a risk they were looking for that volatile play Mm -hmm. that could pay off big and it's interesting to shift now from when we were, you know, small turnover to, to where we are now, where we're attracting people who just want the, the lifestyle and, and the, the kind of the accolades. But you can tell, I think one thing that I've always found is there's a little voice inside me. Whenever I shake someone's hand during an interview, I just kind of know like there's something with this person. I can't quantify it. I couldn't write yep. it down for you. I just know that this individual is going to be amazing yeah right um and i found that nine times out of ten sometimes you get it wrong yes but you know nine times out of ten trusting your gut yeah and never settling for me one thing that you know i'd love to give advice to everyone listening never ever settle if you're if you're having an interview with someone and you've got reservations it's better just to turn them down and keep looking (laughs) until you find that right person yeah i sit on the board as i said earlier with the hobart brewing company here in hobart i chair the board there and we're the other independent and I were doing interviews last week, phone interviews with the final five candidates. And the second person got on there and we asked, the first question was, what do you know about our business? Very open, get them talking. That's to see if they've done their research, basically. And this guy said, yo, it's really exciting news. You guys will be opening a tap room later this year. And Owen and looked at me and I looked at him and a bit confused because we've had a tap room for four years. And, and I've done his research. No, and I've just done this to OJ, just saying, <laughs> cut, cut, we've got to get rid of this guy now because <laughs> it was for a, you know, a senior management role, a general manager. So it's, just, it's, uh, it's so important. You've got to, yeah. You've got to be brutal. You do. And you know, the other thing is there's a belief that, or, you know, we've been desperate for hire sometimes, and we, you know, especially in the engineering mm. department where we're like, my God, we really need help. We've yep. got these super ambitious plans. We're developing tech that no one's done yep. in the world and we need a hand. And we've been faced a few times with people who on paper look great, yep. 
But when they're sitting in the interview, there's something you're like, I don't know if they're yeah. going to work with the team. Yeah. And even though the market reality is you need people, we need to grow, there's the other reality of that could totally fuck the whole team. Absolutely. So we, we've had a pretty harsh thing. And like I said, we haven't got it right the whole no. way, but it's something that we're constantly improving, constantly yeah. trying to refine and, and, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, I think I read a Harvard article some years ago about the cost of a mishire. So if you get an arsehole on board or a B player or, God forbid, a C player, mm. it's something like 10 times their wage is the actual cost of the business. Totally believe that. cost, yep. lost productivity, other team members yep. quitting, et cetera. It's yep. just huge. So really being the gatekeeper of your bus, only let the best on. Totally. And, and you're right. If you've got to wait and go through a few more weeks or even months of pain. It's worth it. Get the right person. Yep. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, that's exactly yeah. our strategy, yeah. Find it hard to define a clear strategy, then communicate it and execute it alongside the rest of your team? Or you currently don't work a simple quarterly strategic plan to boost your team's performance? Our Business Growth Formula online course is perfect for small business owners with 5 to 30 team members wanting to grow. We share the mindsets, habits and tools to be a legendary leader in your business. GrowSmallBusiness.com Let's talk about culture. What are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with growth? There's so many things for, and like we were saying earlier on, the biggest thing is behavior. Just having every day, every day being um, an outstanding behavior towards everyone. One of the biggest things though is actually going back to the hiring as well. When you bring people in, if you want diversity and you want to have different points of view, but I think the commonality that we try and look for in our business is someone who doesn't have an ego. Yes. Someone who is just really after, I just want to do the best fucking job. I want to do the best work of my life. When you can find those people and put them in a room together, it starts to, to create the beginnings of that culture. To put fuel on that though, you've got to treat, you've got to get stuff out of their way. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan in the valley, they get foosball tables. And yeah. I'm not a fan of that. A foosball think, table is not culture. Yeah. No, no, it's just, you know, <laughs> what it is, is I think a lot of kids are leaving from, you know, universities like Stanford or whatever, and the, and the, the hiring squads are trying to, um, you know, welcome these guys in and entice them by essentially making a frat party back in the workplace. But I don't give a shit about um, you know, mucking around. We're here to get to work. Yes. We love the work. We love yep. making stuff. Yep. And so when you, one of the biggest things we've done here culturally is doing everything we can to help them do the work that they, that they love to do. So whether that's making sure they have the best hardware, the most ergonomic workplaces, to give them also to treat everybody like adults, right? No check-in, check-outs, no timesheets. Yep. They come and go as they Great. please. When you get A players together and you treat them. And you trust them and you yep. trust them yeah they give back so much more oh my god yeah 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 but it's so i think that the most important thing is the behavior towards one another because yes. that's all the culture is just beha behaving nicely to one another yeah it's interesting i again read something last year about a ceo of a very large financial firm in the u.s tens of billions if not a trillion mm. under management and for his senior hires the last step he does he might be down to two candidates but for each of them he'll take them to his local shitty cafe diner over there for lunch and sit them down and he knows the manager obviously very well and the, the manager knows to always fuck the order up. To oh, see the person, reaction. Yeah, to see the reaction and how that interviewee treats the, the wait staff, et cetera, and the fuck up of the order. That's an interesting so, strategy. Yeah, yes. So finding those things that you can do to catch people out is, uh, yeah. Part it's of hard the, though. It's so hard because, you yeah. know, people, as we were saying earlier on, you really only find out what they're like when they yeah. start. That's right. And you've got to use your probation period, obviously, very Oh, yeah, you know, very stringently. Well. Yeah. Yep. Let's move on to professional development. Have you, mm. have you done much for yourself, invested much in professional I, learning? To be honest, I haven't really had the time. Yep. I read a lot of books. I love autobiographies. I love more kind of factual stuff. I'm already into the fantasy kind of stuff. But yep. no, I think for me, per, the best personal development, I think, that everyone can do is get, get in there and get your hands dirty and make mistakes and learn. Because yep. when shit is real... Mm -hmm. When your bottom line is at risk or when, you know, things are, are in danger, you become incredibly resourceful and yeah. you learn and adapt and, and get creative. So for me, the, the biggest personal development I've, I, I can really think of is just getting it done. Yeah. 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 And, you know, trying to figure it out. And you make mistakes and you make some wins and you yeah. dating that and you form a, a kind of a, uh, what's the word, a history there. What about mentors or coaches? Have you had any along the way? You know what? I, I wish I had, to be honest. But no, I haven't really because what we're doing is kind of a bit different. Um, there's not really an analogue. So unfortunately, I'm kind of 
doing this thing and yep. figuring it out. Okay, we're down to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? I think there are so many things that, that are difficult when growing a small business, but I think one of the things is the mindset of money versus the service or product because I think a lot of people put too much emphasis on generating the revenue before they've made something really amazing. I think it's so important to, when, whether it's a service or a product or whatever it is in business you're trying to do, to focus everything you got on making the most exquisite, the most balanced, unique product or service you've got. And if that's executed well, generally speaking, the money should start flowing on. Now that doesn't, you know, it depends on your business model, it depends what you're after. If you're after just making a shitload of cash, well, that's probably great. There's probably heaps of stuff you can do where that's going to just um, be the driving factor. But I think personally, you know, when you're starting small, always focusing in on the the product or service, right. just putting yeah. everything you got into that. Great. And James McGregor from Vital says exactly the same thing. What about favorite business book, which has helped you the most? I read this old book years ago called um, The Magic of Thinking Big. I was only a teenager when I read that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But I reread it, I know, in my 20s. Just, and uh, there is something nice about the, the idea behind that is, you know, if you're doing something, don't just limit yourself. Don't just think about what's in front of you. What else is there? What else could it be? What else, where else could you go with that idea and how big could you take that? And I think that mindset, there's a little bit of that's possibly rubbed off, not a whole lot, but mm -hmm. I think that was a pretty profound book when I read it just to change that. Because, you know, it basically says in a nutshell, it's the only limitations you have are the limitations you put on yourself. Yes. Yep. You know, and that's a pretty like liberating concept, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're in control of that. Like you can mm -hmm. say, well, then I'm not going to be bound, but I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And, and then when you start thinking about stuff that's, that, you know, thinking about the possibilities of what's happening, what you're doing. I mean, there's so many times in our product where we've, you know, thought about let's, you know, let's sponsor an event. Like recently we had, um, there was this new expo that opened up in LA and uh, we were going to be one of the sponsors. And, you know, for, for us, it's not good enough just to be a part of the scene. We really want to lead. We really want to show that we're uh, there to play. And so we took principal sponsorship of it, which I loved, by the way, because Adobe, they're a major competitor. They're mm -hmm. like a multi-billion dollar faceless American corporation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they usually just, and they're a monopoly, right? If you're in the creative industry, you're only using Adobe software. So we're kind of fighting a, a pretty big behemoth. But they went in there as a um, platinum sponsor and we got the principal right above them, which I love just seeing our logo. <laughs> right? And yeah. their, their logo, the little Tasmanian company right above us. <laughs> it's great. fucking great, yeah. And, um, you know, that maybe having not thought about maybe that book obviously had a, some sort of effect and mm. even in the convention center we went big we had huge screens lined up with yeah. um, tables and tables of ipads and we had about four thousand people through in one day we just chockers every day lines and lines to come and see us it Jeepers. Was, yeah it was a lot of fun yeah. it was a lot of fun but if the, yeah going back to the book i think the magic of thinking big yeah great any any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development I, I like to keep up with um, industry news. Mm -hmm. um, so I listen to a few podcasts, but they're mainly kind of techy <laughs> kind yeah. of stuff. But, yep. you know, the tech world moves so bloody fast. Mm. It, it's, it's uh, you know, here today, gone tomorrow kind of stuff. So a lot of the podcasts I listen to are just, um, yeah, centering around the, the nitty gritty tech. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? There are so many good tools, but honestly, the best one is probably a spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah like i could recommend zero or monday or any any mm. number of really good tools but i think the best friend you've got when you first start is a humble spreadsheet you yep. can do so much with a little spreadsheet yeah yeah i haven't used monday.com have you tried other tools we haven't yeah the way we develop software is not traditionally kind of how it's run like normally there's it's a very kind of systemized methodical process where we kind of just get together and sit in a room and try and solve problems, develop yeah. prototypes. Yeah. It's, it's kind of more like making music. We just kind of sit down together and try and make something. You know, there's definitely a real business behind that where we have quality assurance, et cetera, et cetera, and there's a lot of stuff behind that. But yeah, we tried Monday. It's interesting. The thing with a lot of these tools is that you can get caught up in the apparatus yes. of the tool. And I think for me, you know, the best thing is, is to be focused, again, focusing on the product or service and not getting too carried away with the apparatus around that. We have really light systems around here. We build a lot of the ones that we have ourselves just because 
a lot of the ones are really heavy because they're kind of multi-purpose, right? Yeah. They're meant to be sold for a big variety of, of yes. people. But look, I'm sure there's value in it. I'm yeah. sure it's probably wildly popular for a lot of people. Mm. But yeah, I've only brushed up against Monday. Yeah, I've never tried it myself, but it's mm. on the list to check out one day. Mm. And last and my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting a small business? And there might be two answers to this for you. Day one of actually starting the agency and maybe day one of starting Savage. I think on both occasions, I'd say, don't worry, it's going to get better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've had that mantra many times before. Yeah. I mean, look, in all seriousness, like when, when you're there, you don't know. Like it, there's come something kind of nice about being naive and being completely filled with optimism. Yeah. <laughs> Even, you know, it, it kind of helps you face those huge challenges um, that you have no idea you're about to go through. And I think you kind of need that. And when you do hit those kind of the big alpine pushes, yeah, it'd be nice if someone from the future could have said, don't worry, mate, it's, it's fine. Keep going, it'll get easier. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. And just out of curiosity, so, yeah. so what kind of marketing do you do for the for the app? Is it just it's interesting? Yeah, iTunes mainly you rely on? Uh, look, we trialed a bit of the app store optimization stuff. Yeah. The best thing that we've done is really targeted the top apex of artists. So mm-hmm. what we did with our product was we were like, shit, we got no money. How the hell are we going to? Punch through the noise. So use them like influencers. Totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, now now it's influencer marketing. But like Tim at Flat Tummy Tea, because he started 2013. Mm. So he was, again, the Wild West right before this really yeah, took totally, off. And totally. You guys are about that same time. Yeah, and but Tim was probably, Tim really had it down pat, whereas my, my strategy was very different. It, it, it was very similar. Like mm. we both knew that, hey, if we can get to the influencers or the people that are, uh, have those key opinions, it could flow down. Tim had a different strategy. His was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, mine was probably a little bit more haphazard, which we've refined over the years. But, you know, if you can find those like fashion designers, for instance, who are really, really influential, got lots of followers, et cetera, what we did is just essentially gave them a free copy. And we said, you know, look, if you like it, let us know and no strings. Yeah. What would normally happen was that these guys would start talking about it online. And for us, social media is the audience that mm-hmm. is like no one's doing television ads no. or, or bloody newspaper mm-hmm. and if you are you're probably a local business and that's great because that's the people you need to target but even local businesses should be looking at social media because that in my opinion is going to be the, the you know the tv network of the future where everyone's tuning into that and, and i reckon too gary v i mean i don't know if you oh, no. he's got he's, yeah, he's a really interesting character i love love yeah. listening to him talk and he you know he, he said a long time ago man when these guys figure out you know, with Instagram guys, Twitter, et cetera, follow out, figure out how much money you can make from their platform, they're going to probably turn a, turn a key and switch it all over. Yeah. He's probably right. But right now it's open and people should be going hell for leather, building an audience they're directly connected to. You're not going through third parties. These are direct customers and building relationships with them. Whenever we have a new release, we just tweet put wow. it on Instagram. We've got a million followers on Insta, so we just, boom, go straight out to an yeah. audience and carries the weight through there. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks, James, for your time today. Very much appreciate it. Not at all. And congratulations to yourself, your wife, and the entire team here at Savage. That's phenomenal growth over nine years. Thank you very much. No, pleasure. Thanks for having me. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. In 2009, had the idea to create an iPad app during 2011 in his mid-30s got serious, shut down his five-person digital agency in Hobart and pivoted all in to create the multi-award winning and number one paid creative app in the iTunes store called Procreate. With 40 staff that now land more than 30 million a year in revenue, the only investors in the business are James and his wife, who looks after the strategy and finances. Knocking back many VCs, funding has been all from cash flow, though it was very tight during the early transitional years when moving from an agency model to one app, down to their last 20 grand in the bank and only weeks if not days of runway. They invest heavily in culture and only letting A players on their bus and know all too well the pain of B, C or arseholes getting through. James believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is the mindset of money versus services or product. Focus everything you've got to make the most exquisite product you can. The advice he'd give himself on day one is, don't worry, it's going to get better. Keep going.